Uh, yeah, so there's some set areas that I focus on ministry wise, but then I'm also like a catch all guy. Um, if something needs to be done, I'm it typically will fall in my hands or at least part of it. Um, so the areas I focus on are is outreach, guest, and new members, and then spiritual growth. So I try to partner with different deacons over some of those different overlapping ministries there, but those are the categories that I uh, focus on. Okay. And what programs do you all have uh, to, to, to bring new people in, uh, to teach new people? What, 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 uh, what uh, aspects do you use? What tools are your toolbox? All right. Um, I started writing down a, a list and, Hopefully this touches on what you're looking for. But when it comes to like outreach, I, I have kind of two thoughts. One is we do some things just to create awareness, like in our community, that the church is here, that we care about them. But then there's also more intimate settings that you really try to build relationships with people. So we do a couple of different things on both sides of those. So one thing we do is uh, when we have a program where we're able to get the addresses of those that move into our community and we send them a postcard. Uh, one time so we but we're able to find out who that is uh, through a program and then we do some other things like create awareness like, like there's an elementary school here in town that we partner with and like last week yeah it was last week we delivered 80 notes to all the teachers and those that work at the school it was just an encouragement note of hey we appreciate what you're doing for our kids um and it's just kind of one of those just letting them know like, hey, we're here, we we support you and love you. And sometimes someone may be looking for a church and they see that and they will come to worship, you know? So um, online presence is another one for us. Like we try to have a website, different things on like social media and stuff, just to make people aware of us being here. But then we do some events that are like more targeted uh, to try to build relationships. We do a thing called Single Moms Car Care Clinic where each Mother's Day weekend, uh, we have some guys that will clean out the ladies' cars. Like, they will sign up and come. And as the guys are, like, vacuuming, cleaning it up, we'll change the oil, look at, like, some of, like, the fluids in their car and stuff. While the guys are doing that, the girls on the inside have, like, food for them. I've actually never been, really been on the inside. But they, like, paint their nails. And, you know, they, they just kind of, like, take care of them and try to build that relationship with them on the inside. And that's just for single moms. Um, that we focus on that week. And, and then we do other things like uh, we have a serve others week. Where we'll just find a bunch of different ways that we can serve our community. And we will, people will sign up and go do those things. And a lot of times we'll let people dream of what that may be. We'll get different volunteers. We're brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so will want to head that up. Like a group normally will make bears for the hospital or a group will go and take food down to a nursing home or, you know, like they can kind of dream what that looks like to just go and love some people. Um, when it comes to like preparing people, we do a, a, a day called So Focus Sunday and we bring in different speakers and we have, instead of just like evening worship, people would get to pick different classes to go to like elective wise. Um, and it will, it's all about preparing them to be able to share the gospel with other people. So one class may be about how do I talk to somebody who struggles with why there's so many different churches? Or how do I talk to somebody who's not sure that they believe the Bible's inspired? You know, like there's just different ways that they can get prepared for that um, on that day. I typically hold to the belief that most people are educated beyond their obedience. One of my friends had said this last week in a different topic or whatever. And I think it's true for evangelism as well. Like if you're a Christian, like you can share uh, your testimony, what God has done in your life, why you are a Christian, like you have the knowledge and the experience to be able to share Jesus with other people. Like, yes, there's, there may be some questions you don't know about, but I think most people lack confidence as opposed to like knowledge. Um, but still having those classes just reinforces people's confidence of, hey, yes, I can go and share who Jesus is and the difference he's made in my life. Most of our success, even with all those different events that we do, most of our success comes down to whether or not someone befriends one of them and invites them into their lives. Like there's a group, I'll actually miss, mention him, I think in my lesson today, that he became a Christian. Now he hosts a Bible study at his house once a week and he just invites friends to it. And people will come there and they will start hearing the Bible and then that will lead to them saying, you know what, I think I want to go to worship. And, it, you know, it just leads 
one thing to another. And there's been multiple people that came to Jesus through that, or they may come to one of our, our events or through our benevolence program and somebody recognizes, hey, they're struggling. Instead of just saying, here's some food, it's let me walk with you. Like, let me help you find a job here. Let's get you up in, in some housing. You want me to watch your kids while you, you know, like truly investing in people's lives. That's where we see most of the results is just through friendship, like a radical love of, hey, I can't believe you're doing this. Um, one example of this is we'll see what it leads to, but there's a group of guys that tomorrow are going to go help a lady uh, with her U-Haul. She had to move here. A Christian from another town said, hey, I know this lady that's trying to find somebody to help her move. She's wanting to pay people, but I think it would be great if the church can just go over there and help her free of charge just because we love her. So we're doing that tomorrow, and she's not tied to any church. And like in the text message, she's just like, this is making me cry. Like, I can't believe people would just like love me this way. So that to me typically plants the best seeds um, in that type of like thing there. So I don't know if that answers your question or not there. Like, Yes, sir. I think there's a lot of fruit for thought there. One, one last thing. I I'm realized that the crime congregation at Mount Juliet are very involved with the adoption program. When somebody adopts a child, really bring that child to the assembly, everybody is involved and they, they help that, that, that family and they support that family. Do you, do you have any more um, uh, knowledge about that program? Um, we haven't adopted, but they, what that, they call it the wraparound ministry and that's where other people can help with that. So normally like they may put out needs to like this Bible class, like, Hey, this family needs a bunch of diapers and wipes. And that class will just buy a bunch of diapers and wipes for them. Or they'll put out a message of saying like, we had a friend that they were getting two girls and they found out that day. And we had our crib that we weren't using for our kid and a bunch of baby stuff. And I just took that over to their house, helped them set it up. And they just used that until they didn't need it anymore and then brought it back to me. And now we're using it with our kids. So it's more of just the church just jumping in wherever they can, uh, whenever the need pops up. So it's not like organized as in like we have a closet with all that stuff. It's just we have it at our homes. And when someone needs it, like we go and take it to them and help them. But um, yeah, it's been really neat to see multiple families step up to the plate and normally those kids will sit with other people during worship, you know, like that you get like adopted grandparents and stuff like that. Um, so. Fantastic. Okay. My brother, listen, it's a, it's a joy to have you tonight. Talk to us about Priscilla and Aquila. How is uh, your wife and you like Aquila and Priscilla? <laughs> I, I don't know if we're there yet, but she probably is, but not me, but you know, we're striving, striving to get there. All right. Let me see if this will work. All right. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Let me test this real quick. Okay. All right. Well, let's jump in. The lesson I wanted to share with you today is Priscilla and Aquila. Um, I think there's some heroes of the New Testament that we don't talk about a lot. Um, and we're going to be able to see from their interactions with Paul. They really made a big impact on the kingdom. So I just want us to look at there's really like four texts that talk about them and we'll look at like three of them. Uh, one of them just references their name and just look at some lessons of, Hey, with this limited information we know about them, what are some things that we see them doing and pull some lessons from there? Um, I titled this fearless to serve because I think what we're going to see is that these were people that stepped out on faith and it wasn't because of their experiences or it wasn't because they were just these awesome individuals by themselves that they accomplished some stuff. I think it's really, hey, they believed in God, stepped out on faith, and he was able to do some great things through them. Um, when it comes to fear, a question I like to ask myself is risk versus reward. Um, anytime it comes down to doing a thing, does the reward outweigh the risk? So there will be stuff to where, let's say your family member is in need, um, you're going to go and help them. If I'm at the zoo and my kid falls in an animal thing like or the snake gets loose like i'm going to overcome my fear because the reward is worth it you know if i'm just on a hike by myself and i see a snake there's no reward for me like picking that snake up i'm i'm running you know there's no there's no benefit there and i think for us a lot of times when we fear we get the fear coming over us of like well i don't think i want to bring up the gospel we really need to remind ourselves of what the reward is and that's going to be what's, what helps us step out on faith, is to recognize, hey, 
I may be fearful, but there is a reward that goes beyond just my fears where there is a soul that needs Jesus. And that's going to be what helps us find that motivation uh, to move forward. So let's jump on in. Oh. All right, there it goes. All right. Um, Acts chapter 18 is our first passage that we're going to look at. And it says, after Paul, let me, actually, let me, I got a thing blocking my part of my screen. So let me actually flip there in my Bible. All right. Um, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth and he found a, a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Idia, uh, <laughs> Italy with his wife, uh, Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome and he went to see them. And because of some, because of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for the, for they were tent makers by trade. All right. So I know that at first it doesn't seem like there's a lot of information there and there's not, uh, but there's some things that we can see. Uh, the first one is we see that this couple is married to one another. Um, you have uh, him being referred to as a Jew and a native. I'm going to pull up this map here. Can you see my mouse as well? Like me moving? All right, so you got up here is where he would be from, and there over in this area over here is what we're currently talking about uh, with the, the journey here, here in Paul's secondary missionary journey. All right, and then in verse 3, it says, and because they were of the same trade, Paul stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. This is just a reality of life, but people are drawn together by what they have in common. Uh, this is just a natural thing that I see in all areas of life. People are drawn together by what they have in common. Uh, let me share a couple of things with you about myself. You saw my kids earlier, so I'm married. I have two kids, uh, a girl and a boy. Um, I'm a twin. I like sports. Um, so I like basketball. I like uh, football. Um, I like ping pong. I love to play cards. Um, any like card or board game, I, I love playing those things. Um, I I come from a family that is divorced. My parents are no longer together. All right, so after this, if I was there in person and you were going to come talk to me, my guess would be you're going to strike up a conversation about something that I just listed that you also have in common. Let's say you're a twin guess what? You're going to come and tell me, hey, I'm also a twin. Or you may say, hey, my parents are also divorced. Or maybe you have a kid and you're like, hey, isn't it great to have girls? Girls are so good. Um, or maybe you love basketball and you want to say, hey, what? what's your favorite basketball team? Like we're just naturally drawn to people that we have things in common with. So I want to throw that out to you is knowing this knowledge, like knowing this is just how people function. How are you using that for the kingdom? Like to know that people are naturally drawn to people that have things in common. How are you using that for the kingdom? One example of this is there's a guy here that I love and he ended up becoming a Christian because of fishing. Uh, the preacher knew that he loved being a fisherman and he had a guy in his congregation that was a really good fisherman as well. So they got those two together by a potluck and then they sat down. He thought he randomly sat by that guy, but he found out a year later no, the preacher had purposely set them next to one another because he knew if they could start talking about fishing, they would go fishing together. And then over the course of time, he became from an unbeliever to a believer. And now he's actually the one that I referenced earlier that has that weekly Bible study. And guess who he invites to his weekly Bible study? He invites all the fishermen uh, from around this area because he's a good fisherman and they want to spend time with him and his other guy that baptized him. So they brought many people to Christ because guess what? They had fishing in common with other people. Um, I see this all the time with those that are able to bring people uh, to Christ. It's because they have that common relationship. But it also reminds me of another lesson. And the lesson that I want us to recognize is a friend, how powerful a friend is. And I know on the surface that may be, oh, that's such an elementary lesson there. Like, uh, I don't need friends anymore. I'm in my 50s. Friends was something I needed as a kid. I don't want us to underlook or undervalue this point, because we're going to see it emphasized a lot in scripture. I want to share with you a couple of those things. Um, in Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10, it says two are better than one because um, they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. If you're part of a church, this is not true for you, or it shouldn't be. And if you think it is, it's not the reality of it. 
But as a church, we know that there's people there that are going to encourage us and take care of us. But people that are not a part of a church, like that's a very foreign concept to them, that if something happens in life, that there's a guarantee that somebody outside their physical family is going to be there to support them and take care of them. And that's why I think it's big that we show up in people's lives and show them this is what true love looks like. I had lunch with a widow a couple months ago, and she was just talking about how hard it was. She never realized how hard it was to lose a spouse. Uh, she knew it would be hard, but until she was there, she never realized how hard it was. But she said, I don't know how people do this without their church family, because she said, I've had so many people call me and support me and care for me. It's been so valuable to have those Christian friends. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24, it says, one who is unreliable, one who has unre unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, 11, it says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. So this morning, I want to encourage you to be a friend. To recognize that there are people in your congregation who are hurting, there are people in your congregation who are grieving, there are people in your congregation who have doubts, who feel lonely, there are people in your congregation that a phone call this week could change their eternity. A phone call this week could change and be reminded of the fact that, you know what, God does love me and his church is a great place for me to be to. There may be people that you know of that are struggling in their faith and you haven't seen them in a while. And that phone call for you just to say, hey, why don't we go and grab lunch together? Or, hey, send them a text and let them know, hey, I just want to let you know I'm praying for you this week. Truly, I can't I can't describe how important that is sometimes for us to be a friend uh, to one another. Um, I think I re we don't have time to like read through this passage, but in Matthew chapter 25, I love this chapter. And Jesus is going to, he he looks at the judgment scene and he lists off different things like visiting him when he's in prison and giving him clothes when he was naked and giving him food and drinks. And he says, the one that you did this to the least of these, you did it to me. And if we can look at people as if they were Jesus, that completely changes everything. To be able to look at people as a soul and somebody of value and importance. Um, the next thing that I want to, to read through is Acts chapter 18, verses 4 through 13. So uh, a little bit of reading here, but I think it's going to be well worth it to get into the scripture here. Uh, so starting in verse 4, and this picks up right where we left off. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Gentiles, or Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook off his garments and said, your blood be on your heads. I am innocent. From now on, I'll go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next to the synagogue. Uh, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians here in Paul believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent for I am with you, and no one will attack you uh, to harm you. For I have many in the city who are my people, and he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of the Lord among them. All right, we're going to pause uh, right there for a second. Here's another thing. Oh, sorry. In Acts chapter 9, verse 10, it says, And the Lord said to Paul, in the, in the night, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent for I am with you. I think it's interesting that God knows what we need. Like for Paul, who we look at as this very bold individual that would go and testify like here before this, he, he got rejected and God comes to him and reminds him, Hey, I am with you. Do not be silent. Oh, sorry. I accidentally deleted a slide. It threw me off there. Um, People, let me just tell you this, people tend to feel more isolated and alone spiritually than we actually are. Let me say that one more time. We tend to feel more isolated and alone spiritually than we actually are. Um, things may go bad or we may have a bad day and we just start going down that negative thinking to where, okay, no one cares about me or why are these happening or we devalue who we are as individuals. An example of this is uh, uh, in First Kings chapter 19, 9 through 18. When Elijah thought that he was the only one remaining faithful to God, and God says, no, there are 7,000 people that are still faithful. 
Um, and he's sitting up here having a pity party saying, it's only me. I'm the only one left faithful to you. And God's like, no, there's 7,000 other people uh, that are still faithful to me. I think of Hebrews chapter 10, 25. I love this passage where we're called together by the writer uh, to not forsake the assembly. Um, why? So that we can worship. Well, no, we know we gather to worship, but he says so that you can stir one another up for love and good, good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some. He says you come together as a church because you need one another to stir one another up to do good works as you look forward to Jesus coming back the second time. Um, here's some reminders. Do we have the promise that harm's not going to come to us like he gave to Paul? No. We don't have that promise that that harm won't come to me from, from speaking the gospel, but we do have some promises that I take a lot of comfort in. And the first one comes here from Hebrews chapter four, verse 12. It says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the vision of soul and spirit of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Second Corinthians 12, nine, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast uh, more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And then John 16, 33, one of my favorite verses. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And I share these promises to you, because what we're going to see in this chapter, and what we're going to see our next lesson um, from Priscilla and Aquila is, we're called to preach the gospel to those that need it. Um, and we may say, well, I have a lot of fear in that. That makes me uncomfortable. That makes me worried. Or what, what if physical harm happens to me? And, and yeah, we don't have that promise. But here's the promises that we have from God. Notice here that the, the, the word of God is living and active. The power is not in you. The power is in the word of God. You are, we are just a vessel and a messenger and somebody who is broken, who can say, hey, in my brokenness, notice God still loves me. Look what God can do in my life. It's not about our perfection. It's not about what we can do. The power is in the word of God. And then here, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Oh, man, there is so much comfort to me in that, that to know that my weaknesses aren't messy up the gospel like it's in my weaknesses that i can embrace that and people be glorified and god i don't have to hide my weaknesses i don't have to put on a mask and look like i'm this perfect person that has it all together and i'm not in need of god no i am a sinner i've made mistakes in my life and i need god and that's why you need god as well because we are all sinners um uh, and then john 16 33 there's two promises here, here that here one is the world's going to be hard. Like life is going to be difficult. That's a promise here. He says, hey, in the world, you will have tribulation. Like, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So when I think about fear and the risk versus reward, like, hey, I can dive in to, to, be, to boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is powerful. That's where the power is. It doesn't matter that I'm not perfect or that I have weaknesses. And God says, hey, I am greater than anything you are going to face. Like, yes, life's going to be hard, but I'm greater than that. And then in uh, back to Acts uh, 18, 24 through 25. And it reads, now a Jew named uh, Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, uh, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructing, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of, of John, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When uh, Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished uh, to come to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by scriptures that Christ was Jesus. What I want us to recognize, our lesson number two, is, hey, we need to be people just like they were that shared the truth. Like, that's not just a job for Paul. Like, this is Aquila and Priscilla are just, they're one of us. You know, like, they're they are not Paul. They're, they are just a believer in Jesus Christ who also gets to be ambassadors uh, for Jesus Christ. And I don't want to overlook this like this is not easy like for a lot of us we feel insecure like what if somebody asks us a question we don't know or whatever it may be but like i said earlier in the in the preview i didn't realize 
uh, Paul was going to ask me some questions about evangelism, which I love because we're going to talk about it right here, is for most of us, like, if you've been a Christian for a little while, you've learned enough beyond your obedience. Like, you know what, what the gospel is. If you've given your life over to Jesus Christ, you know that Jesus is the Messiah, and you can share that with your family, with your neighbors, with those uh, that do not know, know Jesus Christ. In, uh, sorry, in Galatians chapter 6, it says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in the spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Sorry, one second. My, I flipped too far in my notes. All right, I'm back with you. Um, have you ever had a difficult conversation with somebody about their faith? It's not easy because most likely you really, really love that person and you don't want to say the wrong thing. You don't want to push them farther away from Jesus. But yet we got to have that conversation through prayer to let them know, hey, we, we care about you. So sharing the gospel is not just like what we're talking about here is not just teaching an unbeliever, but it's those that were once believers, those that may be struggling to stand up and say, hey, how are you doing spiritually? Or, hey, you may have a lot of this under understanding correct, but hey, let me explain to you a little bit more about baptism. I know you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, but let me explain to you a little bit more about baptism. Or, hey, let me explain a little bit more about what I see in scripture about worship or church leadership or whatever it may be for those that uh, are following Jesus, but there may still be some instruction uh, that is needed there. In James chapter 5, 19 through 20, it says, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a senior from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Notice what he starts saying right here. He says, my brothers, not preachers, not elders, like he's addressing all members of that church family. He says, my brothers, if any among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, like they, the assumption here is, hey, this is a responsibility for each one of us to hold one another accountable, for each one of us to have those difficult conversations with those that are part of our church family, just like we saw uh, Aquila and Priscilla do. Let me ask you this question. What situation would you be open to hearing someone share something about you? Like, let's say you wandered from the truth or, you, or somebody saw something going on in your life that they wanted to, to call you out on a little bit to, to say, hey, I don't know about this, Brian. Are you sure this is something you should be doing? What situation would you be open to hearing someone come to you about that? We're not going to take time to develop that, but put that down in your homework. I, I want you to pray about that. And I want you to think about that. And whatever your answer is to this, do that to them. Because I assume the answer is probably not going to be, well, I would love for them to call me out on the internet. <laughs> like, that's probably not the answer. Like, my answer to this is I want somebody that I respect, who I know loves me. Most importantly, I want, I want to know that that person loves me and to come to me in private um, and know that, hey, they prayed about this and they're doing this because they love me. If, if I know that, like, I'm going to be able to listen to that person. Like if I know, hey, you're coming to share this with me because you love me and you're concerned about me. So let's make sure we do that as well uh, to those that, that need it. So what, another question I want you to think on, and we won't take time to fully develop this, but it says, but in your hearts, honor Christ as Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. And the question I want you to kind of think on this week is, hey, what do I need to know to be able to share the gospel with somebody else? Like, what, what do I feel like someone else needs to know for me to be able to share the gospel with them? And if I don't feel comfortable doing that, what verses do I need to look up? What things do I need to do to prepare myself to be able to answer a reason for the hope that is in me? So I, I made a list for myself. Here's some things that I wrote down that I think people need to believe. One, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is Lord. Uh, God who is one has revealed himself as Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, all right? So that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you have God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That there, that Jesus died, he was buried, and he was resurrected. 
Uh, those are things that I need to be able to communicate to other people. Um, that a believer is connected to the bride of Christ, the church. That, hey, we're not called just to live on an island, but as believers, we're called to be a part of the church. Uh, I need to make sure I can show people in Scripture uh, that teaching. Another one is that people sin and fall short of the glory of God and that we are in need of forgiveness. That, hey, Christianity is not just, oh, this is a good way to live life, but sin exists, I'm a sinner, and I'm lost without the blood of Jesus uh, to bring me out of darkness. Um, and that Jesus overcame death so that those who are in him will rise again from the dead. Um, that, hey, there is an eternity, like there is a judgment waiting. And the only ones that are going to have eternal life is those that have been buried with Jesus and have been raised from the dead in Jesus's likeness. So to me, yeah, there's a lot of other teachings in scripture, but those to me are the core of like, hey, I need to make sure I have verses or that I can talk to people about these fundamental truths of who God is, who Jesus is, who sin is, and what that looks like to start uh, that relationship with Jesus. Uh, let's keep going. In Romans uh Actually, let's keep going. Uh, in Romans chapter 16, three through five, here's our next verse about uh, Aquila and Priscilla. It says, my fellow workers in Jesus Christ who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. I have some questions here that I don't know the answer to. I want to know what Paul means when he says that they risk their necks for my life. I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I know that they they worked with Paul, like they were a partner in Paul's ministry. I know Paul went under a lot of different persecutions, but what a great way to praise somebody in scripture. Like he's saying, hey, they risked their lives, their 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 own lives for my life. I mean, I want to know more about that, but what I know here is that they are willing to sacrifice for other believers. That Paul says, hey, these are people that were willing to sacrifice uh, for me and also for the mission of, of God and saying all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks to them as well. So they did something that helped Paul and his ministry be able to bring the gospel to all the Gentiles uh, there. And they are they are being praised for that. And my question to you is, what is your ministry? Like, what is it that you're able to sacrifice or to give to other people? Because um, the time I'm not going to read off all the examples I have. I'll just share one with you. My wife, when she was a little kid, uh, help pick up the Lord's Supper in the auditorium once. And this lady wrote her card of encouragement of saying, hey, I saw that you did this. And I just want you to know that I appreciate that. Thank you for serving and helping out. And that lady's ministry was card writing. That's what she could do. And my wife still remembers that moment from today. Like that's one of her early moments that helped train her framework of what the church was, of uh, that encouragement. And that's what my wife does now. She writes cards all the time to people. Uh, that's her ministry as well. She writes cards. So you find out what that answer is. Uh, there's no one that doesn't have a gift to be able to serve God with. Um, so find that out and pursue that wholeheartedly. Um, I want to share with you right here in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he said to them all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Christianity is not just, God, what rewards can I receive from you? What gifts can you shower me with? God says, hey, no, following me is about self-denial. It's about sacrifice. It's about living on mission for the gospel. It's not just a life of comfort and luxury and just waiting for eternal life in heaven. He says, no, as my followers, you should live a life that I live, one of sacrifice and service to others. And we see that with Aquila and Priscilla. I'm going to skip some of these passages here. The last lesson that I see is hospitality. Um, this was something that we saw e early on and uh, all the way back in Leviticus here where God calls his people uh, to be hospitable. And it goes back to this idea of, hey, you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So I want you to recognize that now that you're an established uh, nation there. And in Titus, uh, a qualification of an elder is to be hospitable. And in Luke chapter 14, he talks about his followers also being people like you're not I'm just going to love those that love you. I want you to go out and I want you to care for those that cannot repay you and to welcome them uh, into your lives. Uh, same thing here. Like, don't just greet only your brothers and your friends. Like everyone does that. The Gentiles do that. The tax collectors do that. I want you to love those uh, that don't always love you back. I want you to love those uh, that haven't loved uh, you yet. There's a difference between being friendly 
and being inviting. Uh, I can go to a restaurant and I can be welcome with a lot of friendliness. <laughs> like they love that I'm there. They want to be uh, nice to me. And my call to you is when you love people, invite them into your life. Like I talked about at the beginning of the lesson, uh, when we talked about evangelism, that's what it takes to make that self-sacrifice, to really make a difference for the kingdom and to bring someone to Christ. It is to invite them into your life and to show them this is what love truly looks like as individuals. Um, I'm going to skip ahead here. There's four lessons that I want us to be reminded of, of Priscilla and Aquila. And one, the value of a friend, our responsibility as believers to share the gospel and following Christ is a life of sacrifice and it's a life of hospitality. And what I find interesting is each one of these uh, is a core characteristic of who Jesus was. Jesus was a friend to everyone he came in contact with. For those, Zacchaeus up on the tree, uh, the woman who sold her body for money, like it didn't matter who he came across, he was he was going to be a friend to him. And he also shared the truth. He was willing to call out the Jewish leaders um, who were misinterpreting the law. He was willing to call out people who were living in sin of saying, hey, like you, you need to repent of this and change your life. He brought truth. He lived a life of sacrifice. Jesus, his whole life was a life of sacrifice. He didn't live as a worldly king. He let, he lived as a servant um, and he is king so that we can have eternal life. And he was also very hospitable. Uh, no, he didn't own a home, but regularly he ate with sinners. He ate with Pharisees, if they invited him in, he was willing to make sacrifices to build those intimate relationships with people and let them know, hey, I care about you as an individual. And as we wrap up, my invitation to you is this right here, that there is a God that Jesus Christ is willing to be your friend. He is the truth. There's nothing else in life that holds truth of him being the Messiah and that we can have eternal life. And his sacrifice allows you to have a presence with God, to be able to be called a child of God. And there's nothing greater that I can think of in life than the opportunity and the privilege to be called a son or daughter of the king. Um, so if there's anything that you need, I'm not sure exactly how the invitation uh, will work, but please let us know. You have a church family who deeply cares about you and loves you. And I'm prayerful this week that we can go out and we can live a life like Priscilla and Aquila and be people that make a difference uh, for the kingdom. Love you.